All right, guys, we are live once again. Welcome Wednesday night here. Time for the next episode, the Red Delta Project podcast, talking about minimalist approaches to diet and exercise to help you maximize your results. As always, I'm Matt Schifferly, founder of the Red Delta Project and author of the books that sponsor these episodes, like Grind Style Calisthenics, Smart Body Weight Training, Overcoming Isometrics. All of those resources are down below in the description, as well as a link to the other resource that sponsors these episodes, NOSC suspension equipment, very affordable suspension equipment, but a high quality construction that's down below as well. So let's get right into today's topic. This is kind of one of those broad topics that's meant to help you cut right through all of the BS that's floating around in our fitness culture, causing you to run around and feel like you're getting pulled in a million directions, ultimately leading you nowhere. And this is because there's a lot of debate out there in fitness, like big surprise, right? It's like one person says, if you want to build muscle and work out, you have to go to failure. And then you read someone else saying, never go to failure. One person saying low volume training is the best way to go. Next person, high volume training is the best way to go. And it also extends to diet, like sugar and red meat is perfectly fine. And then person says, no, they're the basic equivalent of injecting black tar heroin right into your veins and you get pulled around all over the place with these things. How in the world can you possibly understand what you really need to do? Uh, and more importantly, how do you understand what's best for you in all of these things? So what we're going to do is we're going to look at this as in a fundamental level and get real about what's really going on. Because most of the time, when we find these contracting, uh, contrasting opinions, we're often lost in the ether of trying to say, well, which one of you guys is right? Is the guy saying never go to failure correct or the other coach saying that you have to go to failure? And the answer is both of them are correct. Almost always both sides of a debate are 100% correct and true. You might say, well, great, what does that do for me? Well, here's why they're both correct, is because they're both correct, but they're also both woefully incomplete in their perspectives. And this is the big lesson I've learned here in 2020, is that most of the information out there when it comes to diet and exercise and just even a lot of debated information, the reason why there's debate is because both sides are looking at the same issue, but they're only working with about half or a, a percentage of the true facts. And either they're unaware of the other side or they're just willfully ignoring it. So it's kind of like looking at a zebra in black and white stripes. One person says, look at that black horse. The other person saying, look at that white horse. And they're saying, no, it's black, no, it's white, no, it's black, no, it's white. And then back and forth, it's like, guys, you're both right, but they're not willing to acknowledge it. Oftentimes, because when we get ourselves into these little camps, these little dogmatic boxes, which I'm always saying here on Red Delta Project, the whole, the biggest adversary we face in fitness and in life is dogmatic thinking. Once we entrench ourselves into it's black or it's white, we're screwed. It doesn't matter how right you are. The point is you're stuck and you lack any sort of mobility and flexibility to go in that ever present gray area. So black and white are the opposite ends of the spectrum. You've got this huge bell curve of gray in between. And truth be told, 99% of us are probably going to be best off in that gray area. Neither black nor white on either issue is probably going to be best for us. However, because extremes get a lot of attention here in media and social media and stuff, we get this perception that you got to be black or you got to be white but neither of which is probably best. So should you go to failure? Should you not go to failure? The answer is probably both, but it depends on where you fall into that gray spectrum. But you're not gonna get that on the internet. You're not gonna get these types of answers because both camps are being led, led by their egos saying, I'm right and this guy is wrong. And the other person saying, I'm 100% right and this other guy is 100% wrong because they're totally like tunnel vision into what they're trying to basically push the dogmatic agenda of what it is. It's black or it's white. Well, chances are you're not gonna be happy with either of them. You're gonna be better off with something that's gray. But the thing is, if you exist in the gray, both of them are gonna yell at you. You go gray and they're like, why are you so black? I'm like, no, I'm gray. Why are you so white? No, I'm gray. And that's usually because they're coming at it from their dogmatic perspectives of saying it's gotta be black or it's gotta be fully white, but gray isn't a happy place to be, but that's ultimately where most of us should be. So when we get into these debates, what do you do? Well, the first thing is to recognize, as I said, that chances are you're getting an extreme perception. 
And that's where a lot of our attention goes because extreme stuff gets a lot of attention. The happy medium where most of us should go hardly ever gets a murmur in within uh, fitness. It's all a moderation and all things They're like, yeah, 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 yeah. Tell me what sort of extreme exercise program or diet I need to follow. How do I take things to the extreme? The answer is most of us probably aren't going to be happy or healthy at any sort of an extreme. So recognize there's an extreme to both. See where you can go in the middle. Take a little bit of both and then make adjustments as you see fit. But chances are you don't need to be on either side. The other perspective to share with this is that one of the reasons why this debate exists is largely because neither perspective probably matters all that much. When the answer is very pretty much clear and straightforward, it's like, should you do A or B? Unless it's really important, it's probably pretty obvious. But we often get debate in things because the answer isn't obvious. It's not very clear. And as a consequence, what probably really is uh, at stake is something that's really not that important. Like if you went to failure versus not going to failure, chances are it's not going to matter very much either way, right? High volume or low volume, again, Either way, it may not really matter all that much because most of us are in that middle ground of that bell curve. So going towards one or the other is just a little bit more left or right from where we should be. So it's not gonna make that much of a difference. However, sometimes it can and sometimes it will, but the only way you can possibly know that is through experience. You're never going to find that answer on the internet. If you're asking yourself, should I do more volume in my workout or should I do less volume in my workout? There's not a ghost chance in hell that you're going to be able to find that answer on the internet because no one on the internet can tell you what is best for you, including someone like me. The best way to really understand what's going to be best for you is through your own experience, trial and error. And if it really matters, then you're gonna figure that out very quickly, right? So if you're doing three sets and someone's like, high volume is best, they're like, okay, let me go to six sets. Try that for a couple of weeks. If it really matters, then it will really matter. It should be something that smacks you upside the head. And you're like, wow, what a difference. It could be good or it could be bad. Be like, wow, that's so much better. Or wow, that's so much worse. You want a big result like that if possible. And don't worry too much about like making a mistake and stuff like that. Like a lot of times we get caught up in our little, little area saying, oh, I don't want to mess this up because as both of those black and white thinkers are yelling at you saying, don't go that way. You'll totally ruin your gains. The worst case scenario will fall upon you and everything. So it, it terrifies us if it makes it scared to be able to go in either direction, even a little bit. But the body is way more resilient than we give it credit for. If you're doing three sets, you can bump it up to eight sets and you'll probably be fine. You're not going to have your arms fall off, right? And if you are going vegetarian and you want to add in some fish, go ahead and add some fish. See what happens. I'm willing to bet probably nothing. Probably very little will happen because most changes that we do when it's one single change, not a whole lot is going to happen. But in the off chance that something does, that's even better because now you know, it's like, wow, I doubled up my volume and now I feel so much better and I'm getting better workouts. Good, there's your answer. Or I went more vegan or I ate more meat or whatever it is, I started doing it more in that direction. I feel much better or I feel much worse. Good, there's your answer. End of discussion, case closed. Who cares what the experts are thinking? Your experience is ultimately what matters most. It's why whenever I'm working with clients, when I first meet them, I always tell them, you're in charge. I'm not the guy in charge here, okay? You are in charge of what you say and go. If I give you an exercise and we're doing it appropriately and everything, and you're like, wow, this really feels bad. Like, I do not like the way this is feeling for me. Can we do something else? I don't have veto over that. I don't have the ability to override what you are telling me because ultimately it's your body and your experience. We have to listen to your experience, not what I believe is best based on what my beliefs are. We have to trust your experience instead. So trust your experience over the internet. Trust your experience over the coaches and the experts and the guys making the YouTube videos and stuff, right? Use us for ideas. That's all we're good for. We can't give you the answers you need. There's no way in hell, even one-on-one -on -one when I'm working with clients, I'm like, I can't give you the answers, right? I can only help you discover them for yourself. Bruce Lee always said something to this effect of like, I'm not a teacher, I'm just a signpost. Which way do I go? That way, right? <laughs> That's all I can do. I can't give you what you need. That's your responsibility. So when we get stuck in these debates, don't feel like you're in the tug of war saying, okay, I like what you're saying. 
And I like this point, what you're saying, but I don't like this other thing. I'm going to bring it together. I'm going to create a plan for me, which I think is going to work best in my lifestyle resources and preferences and give it a test run. And then based off that experience, I'm going to modify my diet and exercise habits, how I see fit. And what you, you could say, no, that's not going to work to hell with what they say. They don't know better. You do because you now have experience and an ounce of experience is worth far more than any amount of information that you're going to find on the internet. So there's my little spiel there on what do you do with all the back and forth rhetoric and the debates and everything out there in our fitness culture? Because getting pulled back and forth is ultimately where you have indecision and indecision is where we get our biggest traps. You're not going to make anything happen in this, when you're indecisive, even if you're going to both ones, like maybe I need black, well, I'll try white and I'll try black and I'll try white. And you just keep pinballing back and forth. And ultimately, because you're going back and forth, you never go forward. So find that middle ground, say, this is where I need to go forward. Okay. A little off to the side. Correct. There we go. Now I got exactly what works best for me and you're off and running to the races. All right, everybody. So happy, uh, happy Thanksgiving to those who are going to be celebrating it. Here's Wednesday night. So I'm not anticipating a huge turnout here, but we'll get to some questions here if folks want to join on in. How's it going, everybody? Zorati Karate in the house. Kasha Sibio. Oh, so good. <laughs> uh, let's see. What can we do? Any questions? I've got one from Kasha. Hey, Matt, is there much of a difference between circuit training and, say, straight sets and anything in between in terms of gaining muscle or getting lean? Uh, and the answer is, for the most part, no. Uh, think of it again down on a fundamental level. Like if I do 10 pull-ups, that's creating a set stimulus that 10 pull-ups is going to give me. It doesn't matter if I've done push-ups before or burpees before or jump rope before or whatever. Like 10 pull-ups is 10 pull-ups. It's the same exact stimulus regardless of what the workout format is. It's like I always kind of look at working out like banging a, a nail into the wood. You bang the nail into the wood and it's like, well, what did you do before? And what did you have for lunch? And what's the sun phase? And what's the phase of the moon? What's it? There's a million other variables. The fact is, as long as you're creating the same stimulus, it doesn't matter what workout program you're using. So for the most part, no, uh, you're not going to get much of an advantage either way. And again, this is one of those topics where you'll get people with an opinion saying one is better than the other, which again, for most debate means, well, it probably doesn't matter a whole lot, but it largely boils down to just personal preference. I know a lot of people who love circuit training. They love the efficiency. They love the athleticism, the way it makes them feel. And if that's the case, great, go with circuit training. Uh, I know people who love straight sets and go with that, but always keep your eye, uh, your mind on what kind of a stimulus am I creating? Like if you're able to get your muscles working so much harder and you're like, dude, I can get my muscles to work with much more tension with straight sets versus if I do circuit training, I'm just kind of floundering on the bar and just barely getting through the sets and I'm not working my muscles that hard. Well, there's your answer for that. Look at what you're trying to do. And as far as like getting the heart rate up and stuff like that, it's, uh, you know, often correlated that heart rate up breaking the sweat and stuff means fat loss, but it's it's only correlated. It's not causated at all. There's no such thing as an exercise induced stimulus for weight loss or fat burning. Uh, that's because everything induces weight loss and fat burning, regardless of what you're doing. The only challenge is how fast are you burning calories? So if the workload is the same, then theoretically calorie burn should be roughly the same. So I would say go with whatever you feel is best for you for what you prefer and how you feel best working uh, with these various things. And that will give you the answer what is best uh, for you. Next question, <coughs> excuse me. Henry Reed, hey Matt, any tips on increasing handstand push-up volume? I can crank out a few sets of five, Record is eight, good job. Elbows forward, hands in front of face. PS, is it normal to feel it in the lower back too? Uh, no, not so much in the lower back. You're probably really banana in that sucker quite a bit, which is exactly what's probably preventing you from getting there. So look at your alignment when you're doing your push-ups. Uh, when you're doing that, because when we are doing a handstand, like if our body is at all sorts of funky angles and stuff, gravity is pulling you all around and stuff, and it's very inefficient. So that means that every set, every uh, repetition you're doing takes a lot of effort just to kind of control yourself in space. And basically what it means is you're less stable. 
And remember, you're only as strong as you are stable. So I would put more of a emphasis on getting yourself into more of a uh, complete upright uh, posture. Now, of course, where you are with your position as you go down is good. Hands in front of the face, elbows are in, fantastic, very good. So you are going to move your body forward uh, towards the wall if your back is towards the wall a little bit as you come down. That is certainly uh, the case. But if you can improve your alignment, you'll improve your stability and the amount of effort that your whole body needs to do per rep will go down, your strength will go up, and you'll be able to get more there. So that's what I recommend. And it should take care of that nasty uh, lower back. Look at your pelvic alignment, keep your abs tight, and uh, that should help with that alignment there. Glutes and abs, that's one of the things with handstands is the more you have your glutes and abs engaged, the more in alignment you will be, and uh, the more stable you will be as well. Very, very good question. All right, next question, Jens M. How would one tie in calisthenics with an indoor rower? Well, it all depends on what you're trying to go with. So let's look at the stimulus that an indoor rower gives you, all right? So it's cardiovascular, very good. Uh, very full body exercise. You get a lot of muscle working, very good calorie burn uh, there, even for a short period of time. And uh, kind of is a low impact kind of uh, uh, effect, but you're getting a lot of back action. So rowers work really well as a warm up, of course, because you're getting that general muscle activation, your extension chain, your pole chain, your squat chain. You've got three chains going on in one exercise, which is one of the reasons why they're so good. You can use it in circuit training intermittently. That's one of the reasons why I like using it with exercises. So sometimes what I'll do is I'll give people uh, a strength exercise and then a rowing exercise. So they work particularly well with a pushing superset. So we'll do dips, then go to the rower and do dips and go to the rower. Keep it roughly to either A, the uh, distance you go. So I'll tell someone like go for 200 meters or 250 meters. It takes them like a minute or so. Or I will sometimes I often go with heart rate based intervals on a rower. So we'll have their heart rate up at the gym I work at. We use a my zone where it gives us a, a color indicator for their heart rate zones. So I'll say, OK, get on the rower and just go until you hit yellow, which is the second to highest one. And then they hit yellow. and I'm like, OK, good. Now we come back down when you hit green. Now you do your dips. So I know that they're not going to be doing the dips and feeling like they're just a rag doll and they don't have any energy. And they go to the rower, hit yellow again. So there's ways you can go about it there. Uh, if you're looking for good calorie burn from that, just total calorie burn, make sure you're just putting a lot of meters in total in the workout. So at the end of the day, it's just going to come down to distance. You're traveling on that sucker. So have a goal of something like 5,000, 6,000 meters uh, or uh, even as much as 10,000 I've had people do with uh, circuits. You can do it just as a straight workout, of course, and uh, just try and get 10,000 meters. And of course, there's a good little bit of a finisher too. It just kind of gets everything working together and uh, kind of homogenous because sometimes strength training can make the body kind of feel a little fragmented. And some areas are tight and some areas are loose and some areas are warm. And just getting on the rower just kind of makes it all feel nice and loosey-goosey kind of stuff. So it's a good way to finish off as well. But basically use it any way you want. One of the great things about rowing is it's almost impossible to mess that up. The only thing I would say is whenever we're circuiting cardiovascular stuff with strength training is if Building strength is really a good priority for you. Make sure that you're not doing it in such a way that the fatigue of the cardio is compromising your ability to do the strength work because then it's going to be which one is more important. But doing things like the heart rate base or just kind of getting on the rower, letting yourself calm back down. Okay, now I'm ready for dips. And then you go do dips and you crush the hell out of those and stuff. That's a good way to go about it as well. But be creative. It's, it's a lot of fun uh, to uh, be able to uh, use the rower. I like the rower. Rowers and jump ropes. Very good cardio intervals. All right. Next question. Don Trey. How's it going, man? Good to see you. I don't want to buy a treadmill, but I don't know where to go run. Do you have any suggestions? I don't know where you live, man. But uh, yeah, I've never been a big treadmill fan myself. Uh, run anywhere that you can. I've always been a big fan of forests and trails. Anything that gets you in mother nature is good. Roads, trails, hell, just find a field and go around the perimeter of the field can work for you. And if you can walk there, you can run there is a good way to kind of look at things. And as long as it's not too crowded, when I was studying abroad in Japan, uh, it was very difficult to kind of go for a run sometimes because, uh, you know, a crowded sidewalk, you, 
it's hard to walk on that with so many people, let alone run. But, you know, you find paths and stuff. Whenever you're looking for environments to exercise in, see if you can't get a map uh, application on a smartphone and just look at an aerial map view of where you are. And you'll see parks, you'll see roads, you'll see walking paths, you'll find neighborhoods, you know, and stuff like that. That's always a good way to kind of just see what sort of environments and resources you have around you that are good for uh, the exercises of your choice. Parks are also really good for uh, finding areas to do calisthenics when you're traveling. So if I check into a hotel and stuff and I'm like, I don't want to do another suspension workout on a door, I'll open up the app, look for parks. And if I see the name of the park, maybe I'll Google it. Maybe they got images. I'm like, dude, they've got this great like pull-up station there. Okay, great. And they walk over there. So use your app, uh, map app on your phone or on the internet here uh, and uh, get an aerial view. That finds great things for your ability to exercise well. All right, Zach Evanesh in the house. Hey, buddy. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving, Zach. Been enjoying your emails very much and the podcast. Everybody, if you don't know and if you're not listening to Zach Evanesh's Strong Life podcast, you definitely should be. You're definitely missing out. If you're not, he's had some fantastic guests out there. Also, the Encyclopedia of Underground Strength. The Dragon Door is the Bible. And uh, Zach was one of the biggest influences in my starting on my career. So Zach, very happy to have you on here. Thank you very much, my friend. All right, let's see what other what other uh, questions we can answer here. Wild Child Industries. Basically, would you rather grease the groove or work on the two exercises two to three times per week with maximum intensity? Well, it kind of depends on more on which direction you want to take these things. Now, in general, Remember, we've got intensity and we've got volume and we've got like the seesaw. We can't have both. You can't sprint a marathon. So it's really down to your goal of what kind of a stimulus are you trying to create? Is it a stimulus that requires more volume? And if that's the case, you'll need less intensity. Or is it a stimulus that's going to require more intensity, in which case volume will start to go down? So generally, the way to think about it is if you want to practice the activity and get a lot more um, proficient at the exercise you're doing, then grease the groove is a way to go or just something every day and so on. That's the sort of thing. It gets your body used to the exercise, gets it used to the movement. Something like Dan John's Easy Strength Program is really good for that. Um, sometimes when people are struggling with like pull-ups, I'll tell them get a pull-up bar and every time you go underneath that you, that you don't even have to pull up, just hang from it. Get your body used to hanging from your arms, get it used to that sort of a position. So that way when you grab onto that pull-up bar, you're not thinking, oh man, this is gonna be hard. It's, oh, this again, They're very used to this sort of thing. Because the more used to the activity we are, the more we can potentially grow with it. So do you wanna grow your proficiency? Then volume, grease the groove, lower intensity. But on the other hand, if you're saying, I really want to be able to train that activity at a high level of intensity, I want to get really strong with it. I want to really push my muscle, maybe stimulate some hypertrophy. And I just want to basically condition myself to push myself into that red zone, really feel the burn and stuff. Then, yeah, you're going to go with much higher intensity, lower frequency. So those are the choices you have. Both are very good. It just depends on do you want a stimulus that's intensity based or more proficiency based for that sort of thing. <laughs> All right, more questions here. And remember, if you uh, start off with, hey, Matt, I know that's a question for me directed towards me and I can answer it for you. All right, hey, Matt, how would you best approach tendon strength in and joint recovery? I've been struggling with isometric holds and joint popping, which is causing me neglect more intense workouts. A lot to unpack here. So first and foremost, uh, tendon strength, I mean, tendons and ligaments. So ligaments connect bones, tendons connect your muscles to your bones. And for the most part, your tendons are stronger than your muscles. They're actually kind of the stronger component in things. So typically, they're already pretty damn strong and most likely strong enough. It's your muscle that's the weak link. Plus, consider that whatever tension or stress you put on a muscle is going through that tendon anyway, because tendon and muscle are connected and they connect to bone. So anything you're doing to strengthen your muscle strengthens your tendons. So that's the first and foremost is usually I'm more of a fan of just strength training. The tendons will come along. However, if you're experiencing tendon strain, 
that oftentimes means that there's another muscle along that tension chain that's not working the way it should be. Uh, so very popular case in point is in the inside of that elbow there, people doing rows and pull-ups and stuff, maybe single arm dumbbell rows. What's going on there is there's not enough engagement in the back. So all of that tension is pooling into that elbow right there as your biceps are getting way overloaded. So more in the back to release it into your back. But anyway, um, isometric holds, joint popping. So joint popping is one of these things where the majority of coaches will tell you that as long as there's no pain, you're probably fine. And that's the case, yes. However, my experience has been that joint popping still is a sign that there's a bit of a misalignment somewhere in the technique. Somewhere there's something not quite working quite well. Maybe your elbows are circling while you're doing push-ups. Maybe you got a little scapular elevation when you're doing dips or if uh, like your knees are popping, there's not enough tension in your hamstrings. It's not bad if there's no pain, but popping is kind of a canary in the coal mine. There is something a little bit off and if we don't address it, it could become something worse in time. So with popping, I would say like really look into the activation of the muscles of the chain. So your whole leg, if you're doing squats, your elbows and shoulders like down and depressed, very, very tight, very good uh, contraction. And uh, with the isometric holds, I would say even regress a little bit. One of the biggest mistakes that I've often made, and I see a lot of people make, especially with uh, holds like front levers, back levers, uh, human flags, uh, things like this, is they go way too intense and they can only hold it for like a few seconds. And even then it's a struggle. So their technique is all off and they're barely hanging on and then boom, they fall. Go really, really light. So back when I was saying about using more of a grease the groove to improve your proficiency, you want to get super ultra comfortable with the hold. So see if you can regress to a technique or use bands for assistance or something that's going to allow you to hold it for a minimum of 20 seconds. 20 seconds for an isometric hold is a really long time. Ask someone to hold a front lever for 20 seconds, it's gonna feel like an eternity. So it may just be a tuck underneath the bar, or you may have someone kind of holding your feet a little bit for that. But it, you wanna get very proficient with the isometrics, so that way you're getting very comfortable with it. Then also, because there's less resistance, then you can play around with things like your scapular position. Do you have internal and external rotation in your arms? Do you have enough tension in your glutes? You can play around with those little things to really dial in your alignment and hopefully get rid of that popping as well. Excellent, excellent question. All right, Cavendish, very good question. Hey, Matt, following your advice have helped me a lot in diet and exercise. Fantastic. Any suggestions for lower back pain and shoulder mobility? I fell my left shoulder a lot when rotate it backwards. I know, I know exactly where you're coming from. Here's what I would suggest. This is uh, very similar to what I've had to deal with. And believe it or not, I think a lot of it has to do with the strength in your upper back. So I'll just try and show this as best I can here. When our upper back isn't strong enough, and we're not retracting our shoulder blades back enough. What ends up happening is we have a little more protraction in our shoulders, which makes it very difficult to fully flex our shoulder upwards. So see how I'm here. So neurologically, our brain says, well, we got to get more upright. So we create this lumbar arch in our spine so it's pinching our lower back and therefore we have lower back and shoulder issues so when we get our shoulder blades back more we've got that more scapular retraction and overkill this like as much as possible then suddenly you have more of an open alignment of your shoulder and you can keep your abs tight so your pelvis goes more of a neutral position. It's not quite as anterior tilted, so you're not pinching that lower back. So that's what I would suggest you look into first, is getting that shoulder blade way back for those exercises, bringing yourselves more in alignment. It's exactly what we were saying about the handstands earlier, is you've got that lordosis, that pelvic tilt that's pinching your lower back because the shoulder blades aren't back enough so you don't have as much of an opening and flexion in your shoulder. It's all connected together sort of thing. So just that one thing of shoulders back may help everything come back into alignment and help you with that one. Very good. Greg Cleave, love the, av the uh, avatar there, Muhammad Ali. Yo, Matt, what are your thoughts on working out high? There are benefits such as 
being a bronchial dilator. Have a great Thanksgiving. Thanks, Greg. Well, I can't speak from experience on this one because I've never uh, worked out high. Uh, couple, past couple of times I've been on a mountain bike. A friend of mine gave me some THC mints. Uh, but to be honest with you, I didn't really notice anything. And I told him, I was like, I feel really good. And he's like, because you took the THC. I'm like, no, I think it's because I'm on a mountain bike. I always feel good when I'm on a mountain bike kind of thing. So um, I don't really honestly know. This isn't an area that I can give you any sort of ideas or expertise on it and so forth. But uh, again, go with experience. I would encourage you look into some information based on people who do have experience with it. Uh, Jay Ferugia uh, has... Uh, some information on his website. I don't think it's so much about working out high. I know he's used uh, THC products as a mode of recovery. I don't remember if he's got anything specifically about working out with it, though. Uh, but you might find something there. Of course, there's always a simple Google search. But um, as, as always, see what you have from experience. Try something, plan out a workout where you have a little bit of your product of choice, just a, a small dose in a very simple workout, something that you know very well of what your base level performance is. So then you go with a small dose, you do the workout and you can objectively say, oh yeah, that was better or it was worse or whatever, right? And then you can maybe play around with the dose a little bit, but as with all things like pre-workouts and stuff like that, I would encourage you to be aware or conscious of not becoming dependent on it too much. Um, because if you get to the point where you're like, I can't work out unless I'm high, then you've got one more step and a barrier preventing you from working out to the best of your ability. And so maybe it could be a good doorway to say, okay, if I'm a little bit high, I can perform at this level. So then the question is, how do you get that same mindset and that same approach without the marijuana or without the THC and see if that can be something that teaches you how to work out better rather than becoming a crutch. Oh, awesome questions. Awesome questions tonight. Thank you everybody for coming on. I know night before Thanksgiving, everybody's getting busy and stuff. So I sincerely appreciate you all coming on here. Next question. Hey Matt, how do I feel my lats when I do horizontal rows? I feel them in my shoulders and arms but not my lower back or, or the lats and stuff. Good question here. And ironically, this is one of those exercises where I used to always feel a popping in my left shoulder. We were talking about popping earlier. I always felt popping during rows. And I was like, I, it is popping, I guess. It doesn't hurt. But I noticed uh, over time in experimentation that my issue was I had just a breath of scapular elevation when I was starting out. So uh, that's where I would start to look because once I got my scapular depression really locked in, I mean, really locked in, my lats lit up like a Christmas tree. The other thing you can play around with is hand position as well. Lots of times when people are rowing way up here, again, that's a little bit more elevation, maybe even a little protraction. Yeah, this is, this is what I've always called my off position. Like you put your shoulders in this, like I got nothing in my chest, I got nothing in my lats. You know, once you go here, things kind of turn off. Down and back, stick that chest up, shoulders are down, retracted. Of course, you have protraction and retraction with rows oftentimes, but uh, depression, stick that chest out, glutes engaged, and bring your hands down just a hair. Oh, it's just gonna take a little bit, down just a bit, and kind of rowing more towards your belt buckle. Should feel those lats light right on up, and if uh, that doesn't work, also squeeze in as tight as you can. Outstanding questions, outstanding questions. Kasia Scipio, once again, hey Matt, are there any training considerations we should be aware of and implement as we age? I see programs based on age and wondering if it's just marketing or not. Mm, yes, no, maybe so kind of thing. Um, there's no doubt that as we get older, our situation changes, our physical situation changes. We have more miles on our body. Joints may be a little bit more worn depending on our training histories and stuff, uh, but it's not all bad. In fact, in many ways, there are many advantages that come with aging. I've got a podcast. If you search for it, I have, um, I should do this again, but there were uh, in the podcast I did a couple of years ago, it was the three major benefits of building muscle as we get older. There's a lot of people like, oh, you get older, it all goes downhill. No, there's three very good things that come with uh, getting older because right now I'm 42. And I find that I've 
I'm in the best shape of my life because of many of these. But anyway, I'm getting off topic there. So basically, it's less about age and more about experience and more about what's going on with your body. Because I always uh, said, like, I train people according to their capabilities. If you come to me and you can do one arm push ups, I'm going to train you as someone who can do one arm push ups. If you come to me and you can't do a bodyweight squat, I'm going to train you according to someone who can't do a bodyweight squat. I don't care if you're 16 or 60. It's, that's not really something I'm going to take into consideration. Um, and there's all sorts of variables, like in some ways our metabolism is slowing down and stuff as we age. But at the other side of the coin, some people find that they can recover better because uh, their life is a little bit more under their own control. It's not as hectic, not as stressed. So it's really kind of all over the place. So I would always I always tell people, like, go with your current situation, what's best for you. And, and in many ways, that's influenced by age, but it's not so much controlled by age. Uh, and yeah, it is largely a marketing trick. Uh, there's a lot of stuff out there that's basically like, weightlifting for people over 40 and weightlifting for single women. And it, basically, if you can just target on a demographic, it makes it a lot easier to market to a niche. Like, you know, okay, this one's for single mothers who are Aquarius, who are between 32 and 35 years of age, live in the Northern Hemisphere and like to play the slot machines in Vegas. Like the more narrow you can make it, the better you can sell your product. It's harder to sell generic stuff like get stronger for just whatever kind of thing. Because when you're in that bookstore and you see that book and it's like, oh, that's exactly the the little pocket that I fall into. This must be more specific to me. But you know, it, it used to always drive me crazy when people would say, you should make strength training programs for this kind of person and that kind of demographic and stuff. I'm like, why? I wouldn't tell them anything different. Like uh, people used to always say, you should make a calisthenics training book for women. Like and do what differently? I wouldn't do anything different. Why would I change anything? Like, oh, here's an exercise called a push-up, right? I wouldn't change anything because, again, train according to your circumstances. Train according to what you can do. That's where we base things off of. If you're 90 years old skiing black diamonds and doing one-arm push-ups, then you should train according to someone who can do that. I wouldn't say, oh, you need to take it easy and don't, don't ski that because you're 90 years old. They'd probably spit in my face and be like, I'll ski circles around you, which has actually happened many times in my life, which uh, kind of humbling <laughs> when you think, oh, okay, old man, I'll show you how to ski. And they're just like, Vroom. like, okay, never mind. <laughs> you're way better than I am. All right, next question. Leroy in the house. Hey, Matt, working on ISO straps seems to take the stress off my joints and better focus on my muscles. Yes. Can I get worthwhile training from just overcoming isometrics? Absolutely. Keep in mind that on the fundamental level, strength training is about creating tension in the muscles. And you're going to find you can do that better with various methods. Some people it's going to be doing pull-ups. Some people it's going to be, you know, working on weight machines. Some people it's going to be moving. Some people isometrics. I was just speaking the other day, uh, t this morning with someone about isometrics and how many people find it's a lot easier to work their muscles a lot harder with isometrics because there's such a low barrier to entry for a lot of people. And they make it really easy to work your muscles very hard. I was working with someone the other day whose uh, muscles were cramping and they were like, why is it cramping? I'm like, cause you've never worked your muscles this hard before. And they had 10 years of training experience under their belt. So definitely worthwhile uh, overcoming isometrics. I don't, I'm not a big fan of doing just one modality though. I'm always a fan of mixing things in, but definitely use something for an experiment. So you can do just isometrics, for example, for like a month and see what you can learn from that because that gives you a lot of time to experience it and really get a lot from it and learn from it. But uh, there's in the calisthenics and isometrics communities, there's always this sense of I want to become dogmatic and put myself in this box where this is the only one thing that I do. And I don't think that's a smart thing to do for most people, largely because we just get more benefits from variety. We get more training stimuli. We get a lot more angles. You're mentioning it here on the straps. Like if you're doing pushups on the floor and you're like, I'm going to try training on a straps, you know, the calisthenics purist might be like, no, that's not real calisthenics because you're on straps, which aren't too natural and stuff like, but you're saying, but I feel so much better. I'm activating my muscles more. I'm learning how to keep my shoulders more stable or whatever it may be. 
great. You've just brought more value to your training because you're using an additional tool, an additional way. It's not fundamentally that different from push-ups on the floor, but because you went beyond that little dogmatic box, you were able to bring more education and learn more uh, about that basic activity. So that's what I would do is definitely incorporate isometrics. A uh, very, very big fan of it. As you know, I mean, I wrote a book on it. I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't write a book and be like, yeah, it's not really that good. But uh, the way that you implement it uh, as a sole medium can be different depending on the tools that you're using. All right, James, how you doing, James? Hey, Matt, what are your thoughts on the hollow body position? Very good. I've heard people recommend using it on almost every calisthenics exercise, Gregor Stott on YouTube and so on. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, there are some things that we'd run into where it just seems like, you know, boy, this tool is good for everything that we use. Like this hammer just nails everything down. But we want to, again, make sure that we're not getting too dogmatic about saying, well, this is great. I'm going to use it in every single application there is. And there's never a way out of it. As again, it's that black or white thinking like, oh, this is pretty dark gray. OK, black then. Well, you're closing yourself off from the potential that there are situations where it may not be the best idea. And because of that, you're trying to hammer in screws with a hammer because you think that hammer is always best. So yeah, hollow body is fantastic. It's wonderful. One of the greatest things about hollow body is it really helps us to engage our flexion or our interior chain and learn how to create that pelvic tilt, that posterior pelvic tilt to really get the abs fired up and create a lot of stability in our whole body. Helps things with pull-ups, push-ups, planks, levers, all sorts of things that you could be doing. Um, but you know, I wouldn't, and to a degree, like there's a lot of variants that you can do with it. Like when you do a swing, a kettlebell swing at the top, you create a little bit of that hollow body position at the top of a swing. But I wouldn't recommend the classic, like full on hollow body hold where you're totally protracted at the top of a swing. So feel free to adjust and tweak and modify a little bit as the situation warrants. But other than that, it's a fantastic thing. It's a great way to learn how to use the body in a very effective way, create total stability and uh, be able to have that carry over to many exercises in very good ways. All right. Let's see more questions here. Everybody is on. <laughs> quick, quick question. Why is this man so sexy? I have no idea. I just born, born good looking, <laughs> so to speak. It's uh it's one of those things like it beauty's always in the mind of the beholder. That's for darn sure. I always that what was I, I was listening to a podcast the other day and the guy started his intro. He's like, I've got a face for radio and a voice for print. <laughs> like, that's perfect. I sometimes totally feel like that. Uh sometimes. Um, but uh let's see. More questions here. And again, if you start your questions with, hey, Matt, then I know that uh, it's something directed to me because I know you guys love conversing with yourselves. And uh, that's always a very good thing as well. We're all one big happy community here. Everybody's here helping each other out. Next question here. Jelly, is it good if I only concentrate with one exercise? I've been doing 10 sets, seven reps of assisted one arm push ups with 60 to 70% of my strength per set on my push day. Yeah, I don't find anything wrong with doing one exercise. It's only doing one exercise all the time that gets us, right? And it's like, this is my one exercise and I'm never going to do anything else. That's where we get stuck, right? But I'm a big fan of doing less. Like in my limited experience here on, on earth, whenever I run into the best athletes, the best strength uh coaches and the best at what they do, inevitably what they do is they become very masterful at a very narrow range of activities, right? So they don't have 20 different chest exercises. They have like one or two that they really, really dial in, right? And years ago when at the gym that I used to work at in Denver, uh, we used to have celebrities and uh, like professional athletes come through all the time. And uh, a couple of times, uh, Phil Heath, then the reigning Mr. Olympia came in for a couple of workouts. And I remember one and he was like, all right, chest day, I overheard him say, and all he did was incline dumbbell presses. That was it. And that was his entire chest workout, just that one move. So I'm a big fan of less is more when it comes to exercise selection. And as long as you're making progress on that exercise, keep going. 
Like rule number one of a good plan that's working for you is don't change the plan. If you're making gains and making progress with your assisted one arm push up, then yeah, have at it. Like don't stop and go do something else that's going to be a gamble on whether or not it's going to continue your progress. If you're making progress, stay on the track. But if things are starting to falter a little bit, then by all means, change it up a little bit. Do some dips. Uh, go with like some weighted push-ups if you like, push-ups with chains, suspension strap push-ups. There's a lot of different variants and stuff because ultimately, fundamentally, like as long as you got that movement pattern going on, you're roughly still doing the same thing. It's just changing little variety and stuff to keep things moving forward and keep it interesting. So don't force yourself to one thing. Uh, like you have to do it, but if, uh, you're good with just one thing for now, yeah, rock on, keep it going. Keep, keep rock on, uh, with, uh, what you're doing there. All right. More questions here. Oops. Sorry. Missed that one. Gavish once again. Hey Matt, try your shoulder attraction for shoulder mobility. Very good. It works. But lower back pain always occur whenever I arch it even a few degrees. Yeah, and that's that's it there. Is uh, you're gonna if you're creating that posterior, sorry, that anterior tilt with your pelvis and you're pinching there, that's gonna happen. So the next thing that I would say is look at glute and hamstring activation. Okay, so you got your retraction, and now your glute and your hamstring activation. Now, one of the best exercises for learning this is bridge work table bridges, gymnastics bridges, even things to a large degree like uh, wrestler's bridges where you're not even using your arms, but you're on your head there. Uh, because ultimately what we want to do is feel like, imagine if I had a string to the back of my head, right? And someone was pulling that string down towards the floor. So I'm kind of arching backwards, right? That's kind of what your extension or your posterior chain is doing with this is it's pulling everything down and back. So your shoulders are back and depressed, but your, your pelvis is anterior tilt. So that's trying to lift up. So you're coming down with your shoulders and up with your pelvis and that's creating that pressure. So now your glute and hamstring engages. So everything's moving in that same direction. So glutes and hamstrings are your next uh, step in that right there. All right. Ran, sorry for the random question. I love random questions. Throw throw random stuff my way. I love that stuff. Uh, but did you recommend wall slides for opening up the shoulders? Yes, uh, I did uh, a while ago. So this is kind of demonstrate here. It's a back full retraction. Then you have full external rotation. And then you're sliding your arms up and down. I think that's a very good exercise. It's something I've been doing for a couple of weeks now. That was a very humbling moment the first time I tried that um, it was uh, my boss at the gym I work at. It's like, yeah, just do this. And I couldn't do it. Like I could not get my right elbow to reach the wall to save my life. And even then my retraction was, or my rotation was like that. I couldn't do that. And this is my bad shoulder. That's the one that's always been giving me issues. So that right there clued me into, oh, wow, there's a lot there I really need to be addressing, which is why I've been doing them on a daily basis, making a hell of a difference. And uh, I, definitely something I recommend. But as always with stuff like that, like don't try and force it. Don't force it so hard. You're like, come on, come on, come on. That's how usually we, we get those injuries and stuff. Always remember, work with the body, not against it. All right, what more questions can I answer for you folks? Coming up on the end of it. God, these sessions always fly straight by. It's amazing. I'm always like, well, I've been here for like 10 minutes. It's like, how is it almost 50 minutes? Best calisthenics channel on YouTube. Thank you very much. Simple dips and supremely reflective. You are a godsend. Hey man, it's gotta be simple. That's the thing is when we were talking earlier about the extremes, like both extreme voices, black and white, they want to make things extreme. They want to make it a big deal because that's how you get eyeballs on the internet. That's how you get eyeballs onto your blog and stuff. But the bottom line is when it comes to diet and exercise, that gray middle of the road, boring part of it where you're just, yep, this is the technique, put your effort and work into that. That's really where the bulk of our success is. <coughs> Excuse me, Let me get some water here. The reality is that for the majority of us, fitness isn't sexy. It's not extreme. It's not something that is social media likable and stuff. It's boring to the outlooker, to the outsider, to the person who's looking in. It's not extreme. It's not 
really fancy kind of thing. But to us, it is. Because when you get that first one arm push up, or when you just feel strong when you're walking, or like we're talking today, like being able to fully extend upwards and have no pain in your lower back at all, that's huge. Now, I know if you go on Facebook and you're like, hey guys, I can now reach up overhead without any lower back pain, you'll get a couple people like, okay, great, I guess, wonderful, that, that's good, I guess, good for you, but you're not gonna get a million likes on it, but you're gonna feel a million dollars better every single time you do that, every overhead press, every handstand, every time you wake up in the morning without back pain, you're gonna be like, oh, I feel like a million bucks. That's where the real value lies. And no, it's not fancy, and no, it's not sexy, but it's immensely valuable. And that's really what we're here for. And you're not going to get a whole lot of that when you're bouncing between the extremes of black and white being uh, pulled in a million different directions. All right, let's go with a couple more quick ones here. R rapid fire, Hacker Russo. Hey Matt, are high reps for muscle growth in the chest good? Sure, high reps, low reps, medium reps, slow reps, bad, fast reps, all of it's very good. And again, this is another one that you'll you'll get back and forth on high reps, low reps. The thing with uh, muscle growth is we're better off with a variety of reps. That's why in grind style calisthenics, we use a variety of reps. Like high reps, more than 10, more than 15, preferably in the finisher phase, low reps in the strength phase, three, five, maybe six or seven repetitions and stuff. We want a variety. So chances are, if you've always been doing low reps, you'll spark some growth with higher reps. If you've always been doing higher reps, you'll spark growth with lower reps. So use that range as much as you can. Next question. Hey Matt, when would you suggest adding weights to push-ups and pull-ups? Hell, whenever you want, man. Whenever you've got that inkling for the weight, Rock on. Now, I know there's a lot of like, don't ever do this advancement until you can do so many reps or so, but then you fall prey of like, you know, doing 10 half-assed reps and stuff like that. So weight can be a double-edged sword. Uh, it can help or it can hurt depending on your proficiency. So take this to heart. The way I've always encouraged people to approach uh, weighted, or I, I like to call it loaded calisthenics, so all calisthenics is weighted technically, uh, loaded calisthenics is remember that the weight doesn't make you stronger. Muscle tension makes you stronger. The purpose with your exercise is to do it as proficiently as possible. The weight is there to challenge your proficiency. A lot of times that's range of motion. So the way I think about it is, okay, I could do pull-ups, bringing my chest to my hands. Okay, great, wonderful. Now, if I add 20 pounds on a dip belt, can I still get my chest to my hands, right? That's the thing that the weight is really doing. It's not going to magically make you stronger just because you got weight on it and you're like, okay, now I'm doing weighted pull-ups and they're like crappy pull-ups, right? Crappy pull-ups, crappy results, even if you've got an extra several pounds on there. But the, the challenge is, okay, here's how I do pull-ups or dips or push-ups or whatever without weight. Now, can you do them the exact same way with that weight? And it's going to be harder to do so naturally because the weight's going to make you uh, struggle to do them the same way. That's the mindset we want to have with loaded calisthenics. It's going to keep you uh, not only uh, getting better results, but it's also going to keep you safer as well. Very good. Cool fan. Do you prefer to explode out of the bottom or just use minimal force uh, required? With with what? Uh, out of the bottom like of a, a squat or a pull up? No, I always keep things pretty smooth uh, in general though. Uh, when when you move with uh, control, uh, that's kind of the key, is move smoothly. I always tell people, you can move fast, you can move slow, I don't care, but move smoothly. Uh, in the auto racing world, they have that saying, like slow is smooth and smooth is fast. So move smoothly. It's easier on your joints. It's better for your muscle activation. It's better for your technique. So focus on smooth and then use whatever speed uh, you like for your application. 10. I love the avatar. Hey Matt, I'm stuck in a hotel and can't find a place to hang. Trying my pull chain. Are back bridges enough just to balance my push-ups? Yes, that's ab absolutely. Especially in the short term. Like table bridges like that really retracting your shoulder blades. Your back works a hell of a lot more with those bridges than you think they do. Uh, handstand push-ups also really works the upper back as well. Uh, but like I said, get on your smartphone, open up your maps app, 
and see if you can find a park where you are there and you might be able to find something you can hang from. Stairways are also good. Sometimes you can hang from a stair, but for the most part, I, I would say, don't worry about it. The back bridges, it's just gonna be a couple of days. That's perfectly fine. Uh, that works pretty darn well. Hakarusa Himat, are 60 pound dumbbells good at enough strength gains? I don't know, depends on the exercise. 60 pounds are, are pretty good uh, for uh, that uh, sort of thing, but it totally depends on what you're doing. Remember, it's not about the weight, it's about the tension, about the muscle tension that you're generating. So for some things, 60 pounds isn't gonna be close to enough. For other things, it's gonna be way too much. So it depends on what you're trying to do with it, but uh, you can use uh, almost a good heavy weight like that for a large variety of things. All right, last question of the night here, David. Avilia, hey Matt, how can I build strength, straight arm strength to learn skills on wooden rings? I want to be able to hold rings turned out position, eventually progress further towards more difficult skills. Absolutely. Well, the, the idea, like I was saying earlier, is regression to something that's very, very manageable. With skill stuff, again, a lot of people, they try and go right up to the limit of what they can possibly do and they can barely do it and they struggle with it. And that's why one of the rules that I give clients a lot is no struggle reps. I want you to be very much in control. So find a regression of the technique, whatever you're trying to do, like let's say planches, for example, find a uh, technique that you can do for large amounts of time, 15, 20 seconds, hell, maybe even 30 seconds if you can manage that sort of thing, right? And then practice also higher intensity stuff that you can only hold for a few seconds. So just like when we were talking about with weights, we want to use a wide range of resistances to get our body really familiar and used to the exercise because ultimately your ability to progress and grow and develop depends on how used to and how comfortable you are in the exercise. If you're doing an exercise and you're like, oh God, oh God, I can barely hold it. I struggle, 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 struggle. You're not growing. You're, you're not going with that because when your body gets into fight or flight, the only signal is get the hell out of here. Stop doing this. I don't like this, right? We want to avoid that to a large degree. We want, it, we want to get to a point of, oh, this is challenging, but I'm feeling good about this. I'm feeling confident. The more confidence you have in the exercise, the faster you will grow and progress it. All right. Questions coming in fast and furious here. Another one on lat activation. Can't feel my lats in any pole chain exercise, even if my shoulders are fully retracted. So there's three things that we need to make sure we have for the lat. So I, I'm sorry I didn't give this earlier. So there's retraction. There's uh, inward or there's external rotation of the arm. And there's also, uh, to a very large degree, uh, not just retraction and depression, but, uh, the ability to, well, how can I put this squeeze, squeeze your shoulders in towards your spine. So it's more than react retraction because your lats are in, attached to your humerus. Yes. But it's, it's more like, because remember, your, your lats are basically like the pecs of your back. They squeeze inwards. And a lot of times visually, or perception of our lats is that they run along the sides of the body or that they just are responsible for one area. So here's, here's the thing is whenever I'm struggling to engage a muscle, pull up an anatomy chart and see if you can find a video on YouTube or something of the muscle in use. Um, there's all sorts of great stuff in there. If you can see it in your eye, what it does, then you can visualize in your mind, your brain can get a much better handle on what it's trying to do, right? And the lats are one of those muscles that is an enigma for a lot of people. We think it runs along the side of the body, or we think that it just kind of goes down and attaches blah, but it goes towards your spine. It even attaches to your pelvis. A lot of people don't understand that the lats actually are a quote, lower back muscle. So when you see, visualize what the muscle is, your brain can perceive what it's trying to do better. Study it, study the origin, study the insertion points and stuff like that. And then hold an isometric, like a row, for example, or just hanging from a bar. You can even close your eyes when you're doing this and just see it in your mind of it engaging. And with the isometric, you'll be able to tone in that engagement a lot better. Just practice it a lot, a lot, like several times a day, and you'll you'll get it in no time. Oh, wow. Sebastian, I am a stand-up paddle athlete. Fantastic. How many days a week should I do weight training to build muscle? I paddle the days 
that are not weight training. Well, how many days are you, are you paddle boarding? Uh, because uh, that's going to be somewhat determined. I mean, the minimum that most people need is one. You need one day a week kind of thing. And it depends on how you break up your training. You could do full body just one day a week, or you can do it five days a week and you just do a different tension chain or muscle group each of those five days. I mean, you could do it any way that you want. Um, I'll, I'll give you this general answer between one and six days a week. You know, there you go. How's that for you? <laughs> There's a lot of these answers floating around the internet that are so vague that they're not really helpful at all. It's like there was a uh, some sort of recommendation floating around earlier this year of like to build muscle, you need between 10 and 20 sets per week. It's like, that's going to cover like 90% of every strength program out there. Like that doesn't give you anything specific enough. So I would say do it however you want. In all honesty, make sure you're hitting everything at least once a week, twice a week, fine, but do it as much as you like. So long as you're noticing that it's not having a detrimental effect on your paddleboarding. And don't worry if it is. If it is, you're going to be like, oh, man, my back is really feeling it today. Then, okay, you know, you can base it off of experience. But without that experience, we, we're kind of just blindly guessing as to what's actually best for you. So I would say start with once a week. Then if you can bump it up to twice a week, good. Three is going to be towards the limit for most people. If, depending on how long you're paddleboarding, your intensity, how many days a week you're doing, probably one to two is going to be your best way uh, to go about that. All right. Recommend neck pain exercises, please, apart from neck circles. Go see a doctor. Uh, figure out what's causing the pain first and foremost. Uh, otherwise, we're purely guessing here. I could just throw a dart at a bunch of things on the wall and it'd be just as, as good. So if you have neck pain, go doctor, chiropractor, physical therapist. Find out what's causing it because chances are very good. It has nothing to do with your neck. Um, it's probably something that's somewhat connected to it. Like that pelvic tilt. I mean, it's amazing how the body's connected. A uh, physical therapist friend of mine uh, one time was working on this person. It's like, yeah, your neck pain is because you have a broken toe. And she's like, what? It's like, oh, yeah, it goes up the chain of the body and stuff like that. So see if you can figure out what's causing it and then work on the exercises. Otherwise, you're just blindly shooting in the dark and hoping to hit something by dumb luck. All right. One more, one more cool fan. How do you tell the difference between being uh, free form and being lazy? Well, it really just boils down to, well, here, let me give you this one. You're going to know if you're being lazy because you're not doing what you know you should be doing. But taking time off because you know it's the best thing to do is free form or adaptive training. So, this is kind of my new perspective these days of, of what discipline is. Uh, you know, the discipline versus obedience. I was watching this documentary the other day on something like uh, extreme religions or beliefs and cults and stuff like that. And one person was saying there's nothing more important than strict discipline and obedience. And that kind of rubbed me the wrong way because I was like, discipline and obedience are totally different. They're not at all the same because an obedient person will do what they're told regardless of whether or not it's best. A disciplined person will do what is best regardless of what they're told. So when we are free form, what we're doing is we're basing our decisions off of what's best for us in the moment, whether we like it or not. So sometimes we've got to take a day off and we know that's best. We know it's like, I'm exhausted. I'm tired. I'm sore. We know that's best. So are we obedient saying, I've got to crush every day, or are we being disciplined and saying, no, I need to rest? That's, that's free form. That's not being lazy at all. That's being intelligent. But if you're like, oh, I don't want to go to the gym today. I'm just going to go home and watch Netflix. You know that's not really best. You know that's being lazy right there. So in that case, you're like, and you can tell yourself in the back of your mind, no, you need to rest kind of thing. But you know when you're self-talking yourself out of these sorts of things. So be disciplined, my friend. Do what is best, regardless of what your circumstances is, what are, regardless of what you're told and stuff. Discipline is, is where the results are. Being obedient, that's just going with the flow. It's like, ah, I don't want to go to the gym. Friend says, let's go to happy hour. Yeah, it sounds good. That's not discipline. That's being obedient because your friend is like, let's do this. And you're like, yeah, is that really better? Is that really best? Well, it could be, but well, you'll know. You'll know. And if you make a mistake, then you make a mistake. You could wake up the next day and be like, that was totally not the best call of action. I should have gone to the gym. Good. Now you know. 
Now you've learned a lot of times we got to learn these things kind of the hard way. Oh, the questions just keep coming. I can't stop myself. I love answering these for you folks. I love doing this sort of thing. That's why I love doing this. I love talking to you folks. Uh, hey, Matt, can you use pull-up isometric holds three backfilling strategy? Absolutely. In uh, grind style calisthenics, backfilling strategy is where you have max effort, one set, then second, the third, you have a decreasing amount that you can do for repetitions. So then in your next workout, you increase the repetitions of your lowest set, but you keep the other two or the first and the second one the same. Even if you can do more, it's what I call backfilling. So with isometrics, you just equate it to time, all right? So time and reps are synonymous. They're the same sort of thing. So let's say you can hold the isometric pull up and the first time you get 45 seconds, second set you get 40 seconds, third one you get 20 seconds. Okay, there you go. So the next workout, 45 seconds, 40 seconds, and then you try and do more than 20 seconds on that third set. So backfilling works the same way. Backfilling works with any sort of training modality. It's just a matter of how much can you do the exercise and it decreases with fatigue. So you increase the latter sets. There's, there's for uh, uh, backfilling there. So anyway, I am going to call it a night, folks. Thank you so much. I wish everybody a very happy Thanksgiving. Thank you so much for coming on, sharing your thoughts, talking with each other, helping each other get stronger. I really sincerely appreciate it. Again, next week, coming at you live, same time, same place here, and uh, we'll be answering more questions. And next week, I'm gonna be talking about more in depth about chain training. Uh, chain training, if you don't know about it, there's a free ebook on my site. You can download that. Uh, it's the basis for basically all of my strength training program that I've been using for several years now. Makes strength training way simpler, a hell of a lot easier, and a lot more uh, effective from that perception standpoint. So that's coming up next week, just to give you a little bit of a teaser. And uh, in the meantime, if you've been uh, watching this and stuff, all the questions are timestamped down below uh, to help you navigate questions if you missed anything as well. All right, folks, have a good Thanksgiving. I'll talk to you next week. Till then, be fit, live free.